Hello everyone and welcome to our first ever episode of F-Secure's new podcast, Cyber Security Sound. My name is Janne Kauhanen and I will be your sauna majuri and the host of this podcast. In this show we are bringing you expert views on the hottest topics in the InfoSec game. We're very excited to introduce this podcast where we can talk about our view of the security landscape from our little corner up north. So welcome to all our listeners and be sure to follow us on Twitter at hashtag Cybersound. Let's jump right into today's topic, one that's been shaking up the InfoSec field. Like other vendors, lately we've been getting questions about how our security software handles data we encounter on customer machines. These questions have arisen because of the recent news Kaspersky AV has found themselves in the middle of, and we also wanted to talk a little bit about what we are doing to protect our operations and our customers. And I thought, who better to ask about this than the grand old man of antivirus, F-Secure's Chief Research Officer Mikko Hyppänen. Welcome to the show, great to have you here. Thank you, Janne, thanks for having me. So what is the deal with Kaspersky? What happened there? Well, it's a long story, but it really started unraveling towards the fall of 2017 as we got more and more you know, notices from U.S. intelligence agencies discouraging United States agencies from using Kaspersky antivirus on their systems. And, and this is... Um, it's, it's a really weird story because it really starts from years ago as Kaspersky wanted to get more and more customers in the federal space in USA, which when I started that happening, I, I was initially surprised that a Russian antivirus company would even try to gain customers in that space. Turns out they were successful. They had fairly large market share in, in that customer base space. And now um, it seems to be all falling apart because of these uh, claims that there's some links to uh, Russian intelligence agencies indirectly through Kaspersky systems. Okay, so are there? Well, I've known Kaspersky, Mr. Eugene Kaspersky, Yevgeny. I've known him personally for for uh, almost 20 years. I, I know the guy. I've, I've known the company. I've known many of their key researchers for years and years. Let's just state it for the record that it's a great company and great security product. These are world-class researchers. Having said that, would I recommend using a foreign security product in U.S. agencies, especially a Russian product? Probably I wouldn't. Uh, but for you know home users and users like that, it, it is a great product. I just wouldn't recommend it for that use. The links, whether there's any links between Kaspersky and Russian intelligence agencies, probably aren't any stronger than the links we already have with, let's say, McAfee and Symantec and U.S intelligence agencies. Obviously, companies have links to their local governments, but uh, still, uh, I found it surprising they were able to make market share in that space to begin with. Okay, so um, basically the mess is about information being leaked from uh, Kas uh, Kaspersky's customers through their software. So um, I guess the question is, why would any sort of information be transmitted from, a, from an antivirus client to the company operating the client? Initially, years ago, this wasn't happening. Like when internet became commonplace, um, it started to make sense for security products to collect information from customer systems and submit it back to labs for analysis. But in the early days of, of um, antivirus products, um, this wasn't the norm. It has become the norm over the last 10, 15 years. And today it really is the norm in the sense that every single um, uh, client security product collects information about the clients it runs on from the workstations or from the mobile devices it runs on and sends it back to the developers. This is public information. When you're installing a security product, they will try to tell you this. We will collect information from your systems because that's how modern security products work. Okay. So that's something we do as well. We do as well. Um, it's also good to realize that the vast majority of samples that we analyze every day, the vast majority of those are not coming from customer systems. Uh, in fact, most of the samples we analyze every day, we collect ourselves by running our um, systems which try to get infected on purpose. So we have hundreds of servers serving the net right now trying to get infected by exploit kits or by malicious attachments that we collect ourselves. But then we do have samples coming in from our customers. Some of them are submitted by our customers through our web form. So they actually actively send us a sample, but some of them are sent indirectly um, from the client's 
uh, end. So our products will collect information from the workstations they are running on, and they will submit it back to us. So what sort of information is being sent to F-Secure servers? There's quite a bit of information being sent because the whole idea of using our servers is to lessen the load on our clients and on the workstations. In the bad old days of antiviruses, we had a bad rap for slowing down the systems or eating all the memory or eating all the hard drive space. Well, today we have a million times more malware to block and we're not using more hard drive space or memory. And the reason is that most of this stuff is being stored at our end. And for this to work, when something weird happens on your computer, your computer will send a query back to our cloud, which will then answer that, yes, that's okay, that's okay, that's bad. We don't want to let you go there. So your computer is sending information to F-Secure Cloud, and F-Secure Cloud, which has tons more information than your computer has, will respond. This is why we're sending information back and forth. But to me, as, as a user, what, what sort of information are you seeing that's mine? Well, for example, when you execute Microsoft Word, we will get information that some user, some customer of ours just executed Microsoft Word. Because when you run programs on your computer, we will calculate a hash, like one-way number on what program you run, and send that information back to our cloud backend. And that gives us prevalence information, like what kind of applications are common what kind of programs our customers are running around the world. And this is useful because sometimes when a user runs a completely new unknown malware, he's typically the first user on the planet executing a particular new binary. So we need to know what binaries, what programs are common and what are uncommon. So that's one example. Another example is that when you visit websites with your browser, we will calculate a hash of the URLs that you're visiting. So we will get prevalence information of, of websites that users are visiting. In some cases, we will send the actual URL. We won't see who visited a website, but we will get the URL where the users went. And we collect this information to be able to secure the users better. Okay, you mentioned binaries. Uh, what other types of files are being sent? When we actually send full copies of programs, that happens in the cases when users run, user runs a program which is unknown to us, we've never seen it before, and it triggers something in our protection systems. So the local sandbox and local analysis systems running on your computer think there's something weird about this file. And in those cases, they will send the actual file back to our labs. Okay. Is that something I should be worried about as a user? I mean, I don't write my own code, so... Like, what are the chances that I'm actually going to have an unknown executable on my computer? Well, it's highly likely it is bad. The only natural scenario where a user gets hit by a brand new binary, which no one has executed anywhere before, is that he's a developer himself. Like, if you write a program and compile it, then, of course, you are the first user on the planet to run that program. So in most cases, when we get samples like this, they, there is something really weird about them. Either it's a really complex new system we haven't seen before, or it is actual malware. But even in these cases, we don't know who whose system sent it to us. And we don't share these samples to anyone else. They are tagged as confidential, and they will always stay within F-Secure systems. We don't give them to anyone else. You mentioned developers often have unique executables because they just literally made them. So is that something I should be worried about as a developer that my a brilliant ideas and source code is now going to leak to F-Secure. Well, well, your source code would never be sent to us. There's really no scenario where we gain, gain access to any source code. Binaries, yeah, potentially that is possible. However, if you are a developer and you are writing your own code, you will see this immediately. Every time you compile and run a program, you will get a notification from F-Secure Antivirus. And in that case, well, you are a developer, you're a power user, you know how to go to settings, and you know how to whitelist your compilation output folder. Like that's the one folder you don't want us scanning for unknown binaries, because it's going to be full of unknown binaries every day you do your work. Right, okay. Okay, that makes sense. If somebody were to gain access to the uh, information being sent to us, the files being sent to us, what exactly would they get? Well, if somebody would hack us, <laughs> that would be pretty bad to begin with. But of course, nothing's impossible. If they would gain access to our backend system, to the security cloud system, they would gain access to these unique executable samples, um, which wouldn't be part of our regular malware feeds, but they wouldn't be able to figure out where they came from. Okay, so what are we doing to uh, secure those uh, files and the information being sent from our clients to us uh, in transit? What are we doing to 
sh- make sure that those don't leak. The main, oh, this could be summarized in one word, encryption. Encryption. Uh, to quote Edward Snowden, encryption works. So okay. everything is encrypted from end to end. Everything is uh, using strong crypto, um, not just at the transport layer, but also at rest. So we encrypt everything um, just to make sure that nothing is going to be leaking from the systems that we protect. Okay. Our researchers obviously have access to some of it, some of this information. Some of it, as you said, will be uh, anonymized or... Um, tokenized somehow, but some of it won't be. Are we taking any security measures there? When you use our software, you basically trust us. That's that's the deal you do every time you run somebody's software on your system. And this is especially important with security vendors. Choose your vendors carefully because in theory, they have access to everything you do. And we don't take that responsibility lightly. We very are very aware of the responsibility we have. And that means that our employees are closely vetted and we actually do background checks on the analysts who work for us and who have access to this information. We've never had any problems of anybody misusing the power they have. But the fact is when you are running low level software like security software, you do have to trust your vendor. And this applies to all our competitors as well? This really comes down to your threat model. When you are buying security software, you have to realize who you're worried about. So in a nutshell, if you are worried about the Chinese intelligence, you might not want to buy Chinese antivirus. If you're worried about Russian intelligence, you might not want to buy Russian. If you're worried about American, you might not want to buy American. And that's very easy for me to say because we are from Finland. I guess very few users are worried about the Finnish intelligence. (laughs) That makes sense. So do we ever share copies of, of this information, these files with virus total or law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, domestic or foreign? Many people are surprised when they learn how extensively security companies cooperate with each other. There's tons of information sharing. There's tons of malware sharing, tons of feeds we openly give to each other. We ask others for help and then we help each other, even though we are the worst competitors on the business side. And the reason why this happens is that we are all fighting the same enemy. We're all fighting the malware writers and the online criminals. So we, yes, we do share tons of information, but the information we share is the information we collect ourselves. So we run extensive networks of, of um, honey monkeys and honey pots and honey nets, which collect information, collect malware samples, get infected on purpose, and then we automatically extract samples from there using our machine learning backends. And that's our own data. We collected it ourselves. We're free to do whatever we want with it. The information leakage there only applies to malware writers, and we don't care about the malware writers' privacy rights, right? We do care about the privacy of our customers. So when customers send us samples, those are confidential, and we don't share them to others. Okay, so none of like my information, my file names, my, you know, anything, inform- any information that could be linkable back to me is being shared. I guess the best example on how seriously we take customer confidentiality is that we are the only vendor, as far as I know, which actually publishes exactly what we collect from end user systems. So we have a public document on our website. We've had it for three years on our website explaining exactly what we collect because we really have nothing to hide. We go to great lengths to make sure that we anonymize everything we can. So for example, when we send a suspicious file from a user system to our systems, we look at the path and we remove anything that might resemble a username in the path because we don't want to know that. We don't need that information and we're not sending it to ourselves. Yeah, I guess it's a it's a hygiene thing as well. I mean, we don't want to be infected by anything that could get us into trouble. And when you collect data, um, data is not just valuable. It's also a liability. Uh, we don't want to collect unnecessary information, the kind of information that has no no value. Because the more information we have, the more information we have to secure. It all has to be secured. It all has to be encrypted. It all has to be backed up. There's no point for us to collect information that has no value. So for a user, is uh, sharing these files uh, with researchers, is that optional? If, is it something you can opt in or opt out of? It is the default. If you don't change any settings in our security client, this is the default. You can go and change the settings, but then you will have less security. You will be removing features of the product. 
But this is something that can be done. And I suppose there are environments which want to uh, want to change those settings. So that's a trade-off the user can make between security and sort of privacy. This, as almost anything in security, is indeed a trade-off. You are giving away something, but then you gain something in return. And if you don't think that's a good trade-off, you can turn it off. So I guess the uh, the message here is that unless you're afraid of the Finnish intelligence community uh, going after all your secrets, uh, you should be reasonably safe with F-Secure products. Well, I honestly do think we have the best product in this regard in the marketplace because I don't think anybody is as open about these things as we are. Sometimes we share information with third parties, anonymized as it may be. Um, what sort of third parties are these? Typically, they would be computer emergency response teams, a.k.a. CERTs. And today, almost any country has a local CERT or a national CERT or a governmental CERT. And these are the prime um, contact points for a particular country regarding computer incidents. Um, when there's a large outbreak, something like WannaCry or Petya happening, these are the parties that we work with to get out the information about what we are seeing happening in a particular country. Or, for example, if there's a botnet common and control server in, in an IP which happens to be in a particular country, the main contact point for us would be the CERT. And to do that work, to stop outbreaks, we have to give them information. Here are the IP ranges we've seen. This is the traffic we've seen. This is the botnet control center. And, and that is the kind of information sharing we would be giving to search. And it's quite easy to see why we do that, because that's stopping an outbreak and that helps everybody. Right, right. So a heads up like uh, WannaCry is happening and here's how you can track it. Mm, exactly. And, and this is the kind of information sharing that needs to happen if we want to stay on top of our game. So coming back to uh, Kaspersky as the, the particular case here, uh, what do you think happened there? Do you think they colluded with Russian intelligence? Do you think they were breached, hacked, uh, infiltrated? I don't know. So it's all speculation, as are all the stories on this. So far, everything's been, been speculation. Um, whatever the real case is, I have to say it's short-sighted by, by the perpetrators. I don't believe um, Kaspersky as a company uh, willingly cooperate with, with the authorities, why? Because that would be so short-sighted. If you do that and you get caught, your company is toast and it should be toast. And that's that's a bad business decision. Um, if it's the Russian government using a local security company as, uh, as their way of gaining access to information, that's short-sighted too. Because Kaspersky Lab is the biggest software success story out of Russia since Tetris. Like, do they really want to jeopardize this success story for gaining access to some information? If that's what they did, that's short-sighted as hell. Okay, um, I think that's about it for today. Uh, thanks for joining us, Mikko, and, and thank you for uh, taking us through this whole mess. Thank you. I'd be happy to be back anytime. <laughs> we'll take you up on that. <laughs> thanks. Cheers. That was our show for today. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure you subscribe to the podcast and you can reach us with questions and comments on Twitter through FSecure with the hashtag CyberSauna. Thanks for listening.